what Mike said uh, a couple weeks ago is true. Rather than saying, Lord, if you want to take me home, your will be done, he said, we ought to be saying, Lord, if you want me to stay, despite the reckless life that I'm living for you, and I don't mean reckless in a reckless way, I mean reckless in an abandoned way, then that's what we should be praying. And we should be uh, yielded to his will. Anyway, that's the whole point I'm making based on that, is that to know that we are in God's will is that we are doing everything according to the Bible, and you can't do that unless you know the Bible. Hence, you are in Bible study, whereas 99% of the church shows up two minutes before the service, and they leave immediately after the service, and that's all the contact they have with God during the week. People should be reading their Bible every single morning, every single night, whether they want to or not. I disagreed with that one pastor that came in here and says, you know, if you're tired of reading your Bible, why would you force yourself? I was like, knucklehead, you know, <laughs> knucklehead. It's when you don't want to do something that you're showing obedience, not when you do want to do something. Anyway, but that was a different take and that's his choice and he may not be a total knucklehead. But I just thought in that one precept, we should be forcing ourselves, even when we don't want to, to make the effort to read our Bible, to go to Bible study, to go to church and to fellowship with believers and also to pray to God all day long as we're walking along. All day long. Acknowledge the pretty flower. Acknowledge the beautiful cloud that looks like a, a puppy or whatever. And, you know, that is how you live in the Spirit. You don't live in the Spirit by going into church and rolling around on the floor and raising your hand and making a show for everybody else to see. You live in the Spirit by being quiet and just letting the Lord lead you. So that's my two cents on that whole issue, and I just thought I'd deviate from this to let you know that because so many people talk about God's will, and I can't tell you how many times that question has come up over the years, but two in one day. How do I know I'm in God's will? And I think one of them was because she was dating a guy or something. I mean, she just is that type of lady when she always emails when there's a question like that. So, well, I you know. I, that, I mean, I know you know you're in God's will if you're in the Bible. Right. And, but on, maybe on certain decisions. That well, right, and that's why I say we are given the same free will as non-Christians. Yeah. And so our decision, as long as it's in accord with the Bible, why would God interfere with it? If you have a decision, should I lend this person money, okay? Are you doing anything that would hamper your relationship with God? If not, then you pray about and say, Lord, I'm going to lend this person money. If the money gets lost, so be it. You have ordained that with God. He knows whether you need that money or not. He knows the end from the beginning. And if for some reason you lose that money, it's because God knew you would lose it and you would be able to live without it. Okay? So whatever decision you make, as long as you sanctify a free will decision that is not contrary to the Bible with prayer, it's got to be the Lord's will because He gave you the free will to make that decision. And if it right. turns out not to be a good thing and you yeah. have a problem, sometimes those problems are given to you. They're not sometimes. They're always <laughs> given to you. Or an opportunity for your faith to grow. To grow. Yeah. Lean on the Lord That's right. What is the verse? Romans, it says, all things work. Oh, yes. 828, is it? All things work together for those who are the, the called uh, according to his purpose. Right. All things work together for good. For good, for the called. Uh, yeah, anyway, okay. That verse, I think it's Romans 828. And we say that, and I hear people say it all the time, all things work for good, and they're the biggest basket case in the world because they don't believe what they're saying in church. It's when you truly believe that I just lost my foot in a car accident, but this is for God's good. When you truly believe that, that is when you are in a sweet spot. Johnny Erickson Tata jumped in at 17 years old into a shallow body of water, broke her neck, and she has done more for the cause of Christ than almost anybody else alive today, right? All things work together for good. She lays in bed sometimes with terrible bed sores. Terrible. You know, she's in this wheelchair and she's in agony. And she believes with all of her heart that all things work together for good for those who are the called according to those purposes or whatever. Anyway, but that is how you know you're in God's will is when you can say, you made me. I didn't do anything contrary to scripture and this resulted. Therefore, it must be the right thing. It must be, okay? And, and I sanctified it with prayer. Okay, anyway, um, the Lord shut him in. Verse 17, anybody? For 40 days the flood kept coming on the earth, and as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose gently, or they rose greatly on the earth, and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. 
The waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 20 feet. Okay, right there. It says the waters, I like the way this version says that the waters prevailed. It's like a great struggle and the waters won. Okay, uh, the waters prevailed 15 cubits, which is about 20 feet. So much for the, the theology that the, the great flood of Noah happened in the Black Sea and all of the surrounding places got flooded and that was it. This is a global flood. Every mountain on earth was 15 cubits below the surface of the water. It makes no difference to me what people say. What matters to me is what the Bible says. If God put in his word that it was a global flood and every mountain was 15 feet underwater at least, then it was, okay? And we have to reconcile our geology with the Bible. The Bible doesn't need to be reconciled with our geology, okay? That's just the way it is, and it can be. These things can be reconciled. G uh, uh, creation scientists have all the answers you need if you ever have a question. It's not my big thing, but I do look from time to time when somebody asks me a question. And, uh, but as I said, always be careful with creation science websites because they tend, not always, but they tend when they don't know the answer to something to kind of make stuff up. Yeah, and I'm not saying that they do it intentionally, but they come to a conclusion and they say this must be the answer. And so I, I, you just be careful when you read creation websites. Understand that this is true. That, you know, if we can't reconcile, it's because God didn't want us to know at this time the answer to the question. But I believe 100% that this is true and that it was a global flood. Okay, it happened for 40 days. The waters came down on the earth and the waters did prevail. Okay, verse 21. All flesh, died. all flesh died, right? Remember when we were talking about the Nephilim, right? And it says, and after the flood, I've mentioned that the Nephilim are mentioned again. Yeah. These aren't angel-human hybrids. These were people, okay? And they died. And as I said, it, do, do you have any questions on the Nephilim? Have you ever seen, because you weren't here, okay. The Nephilim were not angels that slept with human beings and made a, a mighty race of people. That's not what happened, okay? But anyway, um, all flesh died, including the Nephilim, the great warriors of the earth and the, the, the mighty men of renown and all that. Okay, all flesh died. Go ahead and finish that verse. Okay, all, and all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and everything creeping and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man. So some of our politicians died there too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to tell you what, if there's one Sorry. <laughs> if there's one part of the Bible that you can get more information for sermons out of than probably any other, it's this. You know, it's not the kind of thing that we would do in a Bible study because, but pastors have a way of looking at this and saying, you know, Noah spent a hundred years working on the ark, right? And it has to be that people helped him to cut down the trees and people helped him to do this and he went and bought the pitch from somebody and all these people participated in it, right? and yet none of them were saved. And isn't that a neat concept? Like I say, that's not a Bible study type of thing because it's just speculation. But you can come up with sermons until the end of time about things that occurred on the earth before the flood, people that Noah would have had interaction with, the people banging on the wall of the, uh, the ark saying, let me in. None of that's recorded here. But isn't that something? I, I mean, you talk about a thing that you can write sermons about. This, man, what an account. So anyway, and as I said, when a, a pastor gives a sermon, always be careful that what you're listening to is mostly flowery speech. It's not sound exegesis of the Bible and in, in interpretation of the Bible. It's him giving his opinion, like banging on the wall of the, okay, mostly. Yesterday, I walked up to Seth and I said, Seth, I, I'm sorry, Jared. Jared. I walked up to J Jared. I was the first one out because, you know, I get the, the, the plates and so I get to get out early. And um, uh, so I walked up to him first one and I said, if anybody ever tells you you quote too many Bible verses in your sermon, tell them to just start reading their Bible. I said, you did a fantastic job. The more Bible you quote, the better off. Yeah, wonderful. The better off you always will be. I don't care. I could just quote only Bible verses for an entire sermon, and it would be fine. As a matter of fact, that's pretty much what I did when I was traveling around America. I didn't write sermons. I just quoted concepts from the Bible, you know, because there's very few people listening anyway, and it was more for people that wanted to watch. But the more Bible is in there, the less floweriness you have to add into a sermon, and the less you make stuff up. And that 
keeps people from being confused. Confused theology, I think, comes more from sermons than almost any place on earth. So Pastor Dave was very good about presenting things and then adding in life applications without flowery stuff in the Bible. So he was very good at it. But what Jared did yesterday was, in my opinion, it was exceptional just because of the amount of Bible verses that he threw in. And then he talked about them almost in a training manner rather than in a, uh, you know, they banged on the door of the ark asking to come in type of thing. Anyway, so that's my opinion on that. I think it was a, a very well done sermon. And uh, anyway, let's see here. Every creeping thing. That, okay, all nostrils. Okay, 23. Anybody, go ahead. Oh, okay, 22. Well, where does that take you back to? Here, I, I know your question, but where does that take you back to? We just did it a couple weeks ago, so think. Where did you hear that type of terminology before? Let's go back to Genesis 2. It's a, yes, it says right here, it says, um, uh, And the Lord God for a man, verse 7, of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. He's saying that God is the one that animated us. That's why these people that are, yeah. And so the, the word I believe is ruach, which is the same word as the spirit of God. It's our spirit, our breath. The word wind, breath, spirit, they're all used interchangeably from the word ruach in the, uh, the Hebrew. And uh, then you can transliterate that into the Greek where Jesus was talking about um, uh, the wind blows where it, uh, it comes from and you don't know where it comes from or whatever. He's talking in John 3 to Nicodemus. Anyway, it's the same concept. You have the wind, the spirit, all of these different things going on. But that is where that harkens back to it, saying God gave life to these things. He, well, <laughs> what people, here's what I think about that is people can say, you know, oh, that, was, that was so mean of God to uh, kill all these poor little puppies that are walking around on the earth or whatever, right? You feel bad about them? They're his puppies. He breathed the life into them. He has total authority to take the life out of them in whatever manner he wants. That's why you see somebody dead on the side of the road. You think, you know what? It was his time to go. When a dog gets run over, as sad as that is, you know, my, two of my dogs were really sick over the past month, and I, Lord, they're your dogs. You know, I'm going to miss them if they die, but they're your dogs. If you want them to continue here, so be it. If you don't, you know, that's, that's your choice. I mean, I'm going to do what I can to keep them alive, and they both are okay right now. But a, as much as it hurts that we lose things that we love, I had a big T-bone steak yesterday. Yeah. Is that cow any less important than a dog? Right? I mean, really. You know what I mean? If you think about it, everything belongs to God. He has given us dominion over everything. But in the end, this here tells us that God chose to withhold or take away the breath of life from everything, including the people which were created in his image, by the way. So you talk about, you know, the effect of puppies drowning in the, the ocean. What about the people that were created in his image? They turned their back on him, shook their little fists in his face and said, I don't want anything to do with you. And he says, okay, right? See you later. Hasta la vista, baby. Um, okay, so th does that help you with that? Yeah. It, it's, it, and th does that help you with Job a little bit? Because you struggled with Job. But I always struggle with Job. I've read it so many times. Yeah. Oh, I know. But, but doesn't that tell you that he's sovereign over his creation? And those last four chapters of Job in particular let us know that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. He did. That's I got my friend meet me at 1130. He'll be here. We're going to go out to lunch here in, in an hour. And when you see him, if you see him pull up with his wife, he's lived Job's life for the past year. He is. He said, don't just, just, you know, keep that to yourself. But he is an exceptional person. One of the nicest people I've ever known. I was his very first friend here in Sarasota when he moved here from Indiana or Illinois uh, back in ninth grade. We've stayed friends. He called me when he couldn't afford to put diapers on his babies. He called me in Japan, you know, faithfully just to say hi because he knew that I was lonely over there. A, and you know what? He's just a lovely Christian. His wife is a lovely Christian. And they've led Job's life for the past year. I mean, you can't believe. And yet they're just so happy, so content, so faithful to the Lord. It's his, his, his choice, you know? If he can be exalted through what's happened there, he will be. Okay. Um, as a matter of fact, I spoke at their oldest daughter's funeral, 26 years old, a year, uh, a year ago, March. And that's what I said. I, I gave the example of the, the Egyptians 
behind the Israelites, and you've got a wall of water here, and you've got the mountains on each side. They had nowhere to go, and God says, stand back and see the salvation of the Lord. 